All right, everybody, thanks so much for joining us uh, this evening, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. I can see from the chat we've got people from all over the place. Um, just typical. I think it's the third or the fourth live I've just done now in a row, and I forgot to turn the music down during the intro, didn't I, when I was uh, when I was sort of checking all the audio and stuff. But we've got it sorted. We're there in the end. But, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Tonight we're going to be going through... Um, well, a bit of talking about a camera and also talking, going through some researching as well. The picture that I want to take you through so that you can uh, know what we're going to be doing is this particular one just here. This is of a wonderful woman called Di Edwards, who I photographed. She's the wife of the late uh, World War II veteran David Edwards. So I'm going to take you through how I did that. Um, we've also got a special guest. There's a segment tonight with a special guest that we're going to go through as well. But what I want to go through first is to sort of um, go through the camera that I used. Also, just as before I get into it, it's just to say that make sure that if you've got any comments or any questions, particularly about the camera or the retouching, make sure you put them into the comments section there because my special guest is going to help me out with those later on. But the camera that I did the actual portrait with, I'll talk about that and we'll go through the lighting as well. The camera that I did the actual portrait with was this one here. Now, this is a Hasselblad, and it's like, wow, Hasselblad. I'm very fortunate the, the people from Hasselblad contacted me, asked me if, they'd, if I'd like to have a bit of a play with it, which I obviously did want to, and they sent me this kit here. And what you can see on screen, you've got the camera with the lens on. The camera is the Hasselblad X2D, and you've got the camera with the lens on, and there's a lens which isn't in a box, and then there's two lenses that are in boxes. Now, the camera that's attached, sorry, the lens that's attached to the camera and the one that's not in the box comes with the kit and it's called their um, lightweight field kit. That's what they call this, the Hasselblad lightweight field kit. So this particular camera is kind of, I guess, the kind of weight of something like, I don't know, Canon R5 maybe or an A7R5, that kind of weight uh, that you've got there. The other two lenses, completely separate lenses, um, but it is a, let's have a show you what this is. This is a 100 megapixel camera. Uh, it's medium format, obviously, with it being the Hasselblad. It's got 16-bit color depth, 15 stops of dynamic range, which is just incredible. Um, and it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it is absolutely wonderfully made. Feels good, but you can see here, that flip-out screen is a right devil to get out. Really, really awkward. Um, but it's a nice big screen. The camera turns on from being off very, very quickly, so you're up and running very quickly. And what's beautiful about this camera is it's simple in its design. You know, the actual buttons, very simple. The menu, that flip-out screen, my lordy. The flip-out screen is uh, touch-sensitive, so the menu that you use there, you never have to go too far down in the actual menu to get to what you want. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, you know, really, really nice camera. Um, it has also got, you'll notice here, one card slot. Now, you might kind of think that's a bit of a, Bit of a mistake there. This camera, 100 megapixels with only one card slot. But what it's also got, which I think is really clever, and this is something that I hope that other camera brands would adopt, because I don't think they have, is that the actual Hasselblad, although you've got this, this um, CF Express card slot you can put in there, the camera itself has got internal memory of one terabyte. And that's incredibly useful. Really, So I think that's a really, really good thing. Now, I was asked by Hasselblad if I wanted to have a play with this camera. Obviously, I'm not going to say no. It's wonderful. Um, but this is as much you'll ever see me talk about it. You know, cause I'll never do a video to sort of do a full review like you do see lots of other people have put videos out. I know people like Thomas Heaton have recently had hold of the camera as well. He's done a, a big video on it. Um, but I won't. And the reason for that is initially when I was contacted, it was to say, look, have a play with it. And I was thinking, great, we'll do a video on it about how it kind of went with the work that I do. But then the conversation kind of changed and it was wanting videos on this and videos on that. And it was almost becoming a commission without being commissioned. So we kind of, um, we came to a mutual agreement that I'll do my shoot, give the camera back, and that'll be the end of the matter. Right? So that's kind of how it's gone. But great camera. Now, obviously there are things, oh, let me talk about actually the price. We want to see the price. I've seen that somebody there has asked about the price. Let me just take you over to my desktop. And I've got, um, let's have a look here. I've got... Uh, wex screen just up here so this camera now i'm talking now about the actual lightweight field kit so that's the camera and two lenses no two lenses 21 mil and 45 mil eleven thousand 
439 pounds, which is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Now, the camera on its own, you're talking roughly 7,000, which I suppose if anybody knows much about Hasselblad, they kind of say, well, that's a good price for a Hasselblad because it, it is Hasselblad and it does have the characteristics as what you'd expect when the files are being produced from the Hasselblad. However, for £11,500, there are a few things in there which I wasn't that impressed with. And I'm just going to quickly mention those now. So let me just show you this here. This, uh, first of all, is to do with the USB-C, where you find the USB-C port when you want to do some tethering with this particular camera. So on the side of it, you've got this little slot that you can open up, and you've got the USB-C port in there, which is all well and dandy. However, the actual flip open hatch there on an 11, on, on well, what would be a 7,000 man camera is incredibly flimsy. Really, really flimsy. It's just a plastic, um, it felt very, very cheap compared to what, how the camera felt itself, which felt expensive. But that just made me think that that could be very, very easy to snap off, especially if you're a bit, you know, the cables get caught on it and snaps it off. And then you'd be without, you know, for, for the sake of a, a cheap little plastic hatch there, a little cover, you'd be without your £7,000 plus camera just because of that if it snapped off and you wanted it to be repaired. So I wasn't overly impressed with that. Uh, that's one thing. However, also, the um, when they gave it to me, the, the actual firmware for the camera wasn't set ready for tethered shooting. Now, me being a portrait shooter, I like to do tethered shooting. It's a massive part of what I do. It's a massive part of um, how, you know, how I help people to relax by shooting tethered. Now, I can just see there's a question here, which I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to answer this one here. This is from, uh, from my friend Stuart Wood. He's put, who owns Hasselblad now? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe DJI. DJI now own Hasselblad. So there you go. Big company. So the other thing, um, obviously, we're talking about the, the, the tethering wasn't set up, so that was a bit annoying, so I couldn't tether like I ordinarily would. However, they did have wireless tethering in, a 100-megapixel camera with wireless tethering. But let me show you that. So this is the camera. It's on my desktop. You can see here when I turn it on, it does start up from nothing pretty quickly. Press the button there and bang, it's up and sell straight away. Uh, you then dive into the menus. You can see there the touch screen is very big, very clear, very easy to navigate around. Um, but then obviously now I want to uh, set it up so that it connects to my iPad, which is what I use for when I'm doing tethered shooting now if I'm out and about. Uh, we go to the Hasselblad software, which is called Focus 2. You then have to connect to the hotspot that the camera itself has created. And then you get the spinny wheel. And it goes on and on and on and this is where you get to the point of thinking i hope this is going to connect and eventually eventually it will connect i remember seeing this video when i start to move my fingers there we go right so now it's connected and but once it is up and running you know things do work really really well so look if i take a quick shot you'll see here pressing it see it come up on the back of the camera and you'll see it come up on the on the ipad so that's pretty quick you know that's quite that's quite impressive stuff there that um you know, for, for shooting tethered, but I'm not one who wants to shoot wireless tethering. There's a couple of reasons for it, the reliability of it. You know, if, you can't, if you're relying on Wi-Fi and wireless tethering to work and it doesn't, you know, gremlins always get in the system, don't they? And they actually prevent it from happening. But also the battery life. If you're doing a long portrait shoot in a studio, that camera is being powered. It's a big camera producing big files. That's using the battery, but also then you're using it Wi-Fi, which is also going to drain the battery quicker. So for longevity, I don't really like to use wireless. I much, much prefer the stability of uh, shooting wired. The last thing I want to talk about with this particular camera is to do with this. And this nearly caught me out. This really did nearly catch me out. Uh, and it's to do with the clip, how you actually attach the strap to the camera itself. Now, ordinarily on cameras, you'll have that loop system where you kind of loop the actual ends of the cable, uh, your strap rather, round it, and it locks secure. But with this one, there's like these metal circles that you kind of slide these metal catches onto, uh, and it kind of holds in. Now, the left-hand side one, I didn't have a problem with, but the right-hand side one, oh, my God, that slipped out more times than I dare to remember, which is not a good thing. Not a good thing to happen. And as typical, we're trying to demonstrate it here on this particular video. It doesn't look like it came out that easy. But when there are many times when I popped out with this particular camera, 
I'd have the strap on because I'm thinking I've got eleven and a half thousand pounds worth of kit here that isn't mine. I need to be really careful. So I have the strap on it. I'm holding it like this. Every now and again, you know, you sit down and the camera's kind of resting on your lap and the, the actual strap around your neck loosens off. I'd then go to stand up and I don't know how, but that right-hand clip somehow worked free. And as I stand up, the camera starts to drop and I had to grab it. Now, and that happened more than a couple of times. So something like that, not good. That's not the way, particularly when you think that this camera is kind of aimed at architectural photography, uh, street photographers. I mean, people walking around the streets of London with a Hasselblad camera doing street photography, very, very brave. Uh, but you want a strap that's going to be nice and secure. So I, I reckon if you did have this, you would have to invest in some other kind of third party uh, strap that's going to make it much more secure by screwing into the underneath side of the of the camera. So that's um, that's the camera itself, the Hasselblad X2D. Uh, and that's as much as I'm going to talk about when it comes to <laughs> talks to uh, talk about that camera. But let me just dive. We're going to move on now. Let's have a look at the actual portrait again and now move on to the lighting side of things. So let's just jump back over to my screen here. Let's just jump onto the screen and we'll go to my Lightroom. And again, just as a reminder, then this is the picture that we're going to go through tonight. Nice and simple. Now, when I went round originally to do this particular shoot, which wasn't a paid shoot, it was something that I wanted to do because I just, it's very rare I'll do paid portrait shoots. It's generally stuff that I like to do for people and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of go there as I do normally with all my kit, my camera, uh, well, not my camera, this Hasselblad camera um, and soft boxes and lighting because I didn't know, you know, I, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do with it. Uh, Will Rose has just put down there, did I use the 55 mil? Uh, for the portrait, yes, I did, mate. Yes, I did. 55 mil lens for the portrait. Um, so when I go in, my normal practice when I'm doing a portrait shoot isn't to kind of knock on the door with all the kit laden over my shoulders and then go in. As is always the way with me, uh, even though I know Di Edwards, knock on the door, her son Chris is there as well, and we, I go in with no kit, all the kit's in the car, and we just chat and what have you. And as I'm chatting to Di, I then start to realise, do you know the lighting in here is really, really good? I don't need to use my soft boxes because you can see here, this is the actual lighting setup. This is it. You know, one big double patio door. Now that's creating light, the same light, if not better, than I would have wanted to create with a soft box. So why on earth would I, you know, make things more difficult by bringing in lighting and bringing that kind of element in? I've got the lighting there for me. So this was quite a rarity for me to do a natural light photograph. Okay, so a natural light portrait. So yeah, so that's the kind of, uh, that's the lighting setup there, really, really simple. Now, if we uh, move over to my desktop again, let's just show you the actual picture here. That's the finished retouched image. And if I go to this one here, this is the out of camera image. Okay, so that's the raw file out of camera. And to give you an idea of what this, uh, what this computer kind of, uh, produces, oh, sorry, this, this camera produces in file size um, on the longest edge, 11,656 pixels. It is a huge, huge file. In fact, there's something I want to show you here to do with the actual file size and the quality of this Hasselblad file. Let me show you this. If I just come over to this image here, this is the first ever picture that I grabbed with it. I've, clearly, it's not one that I was thinking, oh, this is a nice shot. I literally just grabbed a picture. But this is Lime Regis, and the way in the distance there, you've got the cob, what's called the cob, way, way in the distance. Now, look, if I, I've got this set to zoom to 800%, and if I zoom in way in on the distance over here on the cob, look at this. Let's just bring it in. Look, you can still see at 800% magnification, you can still see people. Even to the point of, I mean, that's, that's still usable, really. I mean, you'd never crop this much. But even the steps, look, leading up onto the top of the cob, you can actually see the individual steps from that distance away. I mean, that is that is incredible. Absolutely incredible. So that side of things, when it comes to the actual file itself, wow. But what I will say about this camera is, at no point did I go, this is a game changer. You know, I've got my A7R4, which I use, you know, as my main portrait camera. I recently had uh, the opportunity to shoot with a Canon R5, fantastic camera. At no point did I go, oh, my Lord, it kicks those into the dust. It really didn't. I wouldn't buy this Hasselblad. It's basically what I'm saying. If I was given it, great. 
but there's no way I could justify what I didn't see as being a huge leap from my mirrorless camera to this house of blood for that kind of money. So yeah, there you go. There could well be people out there that are going to disagree with that, but that, that was my own thoughts on it. So enough of that. Let's now dive in and let's go through the retouching. Now, what I am going to do is at the moment, I've got this huge mic in front of me here. I'm going to switch over to what I've got here, a Lavalier mic here, wireless mic. You're going to notice a bit of a change in the quality of the audio, but you're still going to hear me. But it allows me to have my hands free while I uh, do this uh, editing as well. So let's just uh, turn this one off. Turn this one on. So you should still be able to hear me, but it will be different. All right, let me just move this out of the way. And we'll dive over to my desktop. All right, let's have a look. Let's get the out of camera picture of Di Edwards just there. And just take you through some of the things that I did in Lightroom and Photoshop to do with this picture here, to get it all retouched. And there wasn't, thankfully, that much to do at all. I wanted to keep it, you know, I wanted to keep this clean. I didn't want to be doing tons and tons of stuff and, you know, color grading and all that. This was to be just a nice, clean, crisp portrait of, a, of a, what is a wonderful, wonderful woman. So let me just take you through. So, okay, in, uh, in Lightroom then, the first thing I did was just uh, using that 55 mil lens, I'm gonna go to the crop tool and just bring in just a little bit on the side. But as I do that, you can see it's bringing it in, it's constraining the proportions, which I don't want to do. So that's because we've got it locked. I'll just press the keyboard shortcut of A to unlock it. So now I can kind of like free transform it. So uh, Tom Wall says it's a little bit louder and clearer. Oh, cool, okay, that's good to know. Uh, Tom, thank you very much to do with the microphone. All right, so if I just take it to around about there, and then I'm gonna to go to the basics panel and just bring down the highlights. They just look a little bit too, uh, too bright for me. So we'll just bring those down a touch and you can see how that affects the skin as well. Don't wanna take it down too much. We'll go to around about there. And then the next thing that kind of jumps out to me is the actual hand, her hand here just looks a little bit too bright. And obviously now in Lightroom and Camera Rule, we've got the most amazing masking that's just getting better and better and better. So I'll go to the masking section and I'm just gonna grab a brush. I'll make sure the overlay is turned on and I'll just brush over her hand, just to uh, something like that, very loosely. And I'll just bring down the highlights and just a tad on the exposure as well. Not too much, because if I go too far, it's gonna to start to look muddy and kind of strange. But just a little bit, just take it off there like that, all right. Next thing I'll do, I'm gonna just start to shape the light a little bit now, because I wanted all the focus to be on Di Edwards. I didn't want all the light around her. I wanted everyone to just, when you look at the picture, to go straight into her. So for me to direct the viewer, if you like, I'm gonna use, first of all, a gradient. So we'll go to the effects panel and we'll do the vignette. And I'm just gonna drag it in to round about, say, there. And I'm also gonna go back to the, the masking, actually. Let's just go to the masking. I'm gonna add another mask and use the radial gradient and just drag it out over die somewhere about there. And I'm gonna invert it so that I can now darken it just a little bit closer into die. So we'll take it there and then just lower the exposure. So we get to kind of that kind of look there. So already we're starting to shape the light, bring it into die. We're not being too focused around the outside of the room. I think the last thing I'll do or the penultimate thing I'll do in Lightroom at the moment is then just add another mask and I'm just gonna get a brush. And this cushion right at the bottom here is kind of, I find that a little bit distracting. So I'm just gonna uh, brush over that, make sure I can see my overlay. And I'm just gonna brush over it like so, nice and simple. And then all I'm gonna do is just lower the exposure. Let's just hide it. Let's just get rid of it just a little bit there so it doesn't kind of draw the eye in. All right, something like that. Uh, come out of the masking, and before we go into Photoshop, because there's a few things I want to do in there, let's just do a tiny bit of sharpening. Now, the default when it comes to doing sharpening in, in Lightroom is set to 40. I think that's a little bit too much, uh, certainly for a portrait like this where you've got a, an elderly lady, we've got lovely skin. I'm going to bring it right down. I'm going to probably go for around about 20. So we'll take it right down to 20. And then we'll use the masking slider. I'm going to hold down the Option key on Mac or Alt key on Windows to get that masking view there. And obviously the further I drag it over to the right, the less areas are being sharpened. And the white areas are where it's being sharpened, which is mainly to do with dye. Around about there will be fine. All right. So I can press the uh, backslash key now to see before and after, before and after. That's as much as I want to do 
uh, in, in Lightroom. I'm now gonna send it into Photoshop because there's just a few little things I wanna go through in there, which obviously I can't do in here. So I'm gonna go to Photo, Edit In, and I'm gonna choose Photoshop Beta. Now, I don't have to use Photoshop Beta for this particular edit, but there is something else I'm gonna show you uh, on another picture in a moment that needs me to be in there. So that's why we'll do it. So we'll go to Photoshop Beta. And let's just dive over, open up here, and we should see if we can just get into open up. There we go. Now I'm not using the, um, the latest version of Photoshop, be uh, Photoshop Beta because what I found is with that one, the latest version, if I try to send an image from Lightroom into Photoshop Beta, it doesn't seem to work. It kind of opens up Photoshop Beta, but the image doesn't open up. So if you're having that problem as well, just roll it back one version and then you'll be able to use the beta as well. But you won't have the generative fill uh, crop. That won't, that won't be there, okay? So you have to kind of do that in a different kind of way. But that's the workaround at the moment. Obviously, it's in beta. You know, we're going to get issues with it. Um, right, so now that we're in here, the couple of things that I want to show you in here then. So the first thing I'm going to do is if I zoom in, you can see that she's got just a little bit of a scratch or a cut on her nose here. So I want to get rid of that. Uh, and I'm gonna use over on the toolbar here, this amazing tool called the Remove Tool, which uses artificial intelligence. It is so, so much better than the Healing Brush or the Content Aware. This is an incredible tool. It can do so, so much. So what I'm gonna do with this one is I'm gonna add a new layer, first of all, and I'm going to call this one Clean. We'll just call this one Clean. And then all I'm gonna do, make sure that in the options bar at the top of the screen, obviously whatever tool we have, you have different options available. Just make sure that if you are using a blank layer, you have the sample all layers checkbox uh, with a tick in it, all right? And I've got this, this one set so that every time I add a stroke and then release, it then applies it. So let's just see, I'll just quickly brush over this particular area of her nose here to make that, that make sure, see if it can fix it. It's not using content aware, it's generative fill, it's using artificial intelligence to kind of repair the skin and to cover that over. And it does the most amazing job, absolutely amazing. And it's also good, I mean, I'm not gonna do all of them in this retouch while you're sat there, but I also use this to get rid of all, some of these, not all of them, but just some of the loose hair here uh, if I just paint over it, you give it a second or two as it sends it up, works it all out, and then it'll give you a quick fix, and then boom, gone. So it does a really good job on stuff like this. So there you go. And the great thing is it's not reliant on how powerful your computer is, because obviously this is using AI, it goes up to the cloud, comes back down and whatever, and gets it fixed. So it does an amazing job there on the skin and on the hair, but it's not relevant to this picture, but relevant to the remove tool. I want to just quickly show you this, how how effective that remove tool is. This picture here is one that me and my friend Anthony did on, God, losing track of time here, Friday of last week. We went over to Pembrokeshire, did a bit of a hike up 1500 feet with a friend of ours called Dio Tool to take some portraits. This isn't the finished picture, by the way, but I wanted to show you an issue on this picture. Uh, the, the remove tool was just amazing at fixing. So if you can imagine now, this is Dai, he's here. Down here on the right-hand side where they've got this dead space is where the lighting was, okay? That's where the lighting was coming in. Now, the lighting, as you can see, because it was a distance away and we didn't use a softbox because uh, the light wasn't powerful enough, we've created a hard shadow coming off the walking pole here. And that could be quite a challenge to remove that. You know, bearing in mind there's all these creases and folds in his clothing, to remove that could be quite difficult. But re using the remove tool, amazing. So I'll just add a new blank layer. I'm using the remove tool. If I just zoom in a little bit more, and all I'm gonna do is just, I'll just do it on a little bit of a section here. So if I just brush over this, look at all the folds in the clothing, and I'll go to there, let's say. Give it a second or two. It'll remove it, but it still keeps the folds. That just blows me away. Absolutely fantastic. So we're going like before and after. Unbelievable. I've obviously got more I could remove down here. But how it does that, it just blows me away. Absolutely fantastic tool. In fact, if we check it out down here, look, if I come to his shoes, where he's got his walking shoes, I can also use the remove tool on there where we've got the little shadow being cast off the walking pole just there. And if I just brush over it, like so, to remove it so there's no trace of there being artificial light used in the picture, if we just release it, give it a second or two, and bang, look at that. It rebuilds the shoe 
and removes the actual shad. Just incredible stuff, absolutely incredible. So yeah, the remove tool in Photoshop, which isn't in beta, it's in the normal version as well. If you've not tried it, definitely give it a try. It is incredibly, incredibly powerful. But getting back to the picture of dye, where did we get to? So we're gonna kind of cleaning through now. Now, what I've done is, uh, if we look at our glasses, bearing in mind now we, we've shot this on a Hasselblad, 100 megapixel camera, it's gonna pick up the finest, finest details, things that we don't necessarily want. And in here we can see there's, you know, these kind of specks of dust and what have you on our glasses. And I didn't want them to be in there, I wanted to remove those. So let's just remove these specks on here. Now I'm not gonna use the remove tool, I'm actually gonna use a filter. But what I'll do first of all is I'll click on the, um, original image at the bottom here in the background layer here in the layers panel and I'll just duplicate that by pressing command or control J to get a copy and let's just call that one glasses. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the filter menu choose noise dust and scratches all right so we'll go to dust and scratches when this filter comes up all I'll do is I'll take the actual settings all the way down to zero I can then click bring my cursor over an area that I want to have in this kind of preview area on the dust and scratches filter. So I'll choose here and click down. It brings that into the preview and I can also then zoom in like so. But look at this, if I bring up the radius, the radius is saying, right, how much do you want me to remove it by? And if I bring it up too much, it obviously smooths it out way too much. I don't need to use much of a radius here. I reckon around about one or two is gonna be pretty good. And already, I don't know how this is showing up on your particular screen there, but if I just turn that off and on, you can probably see how that is already removing all of those dust and scratches, uh, the dust and whatever on the actual lenses of the glasses. Now the, the sort of, the, uh, the problem with that is it's gonna smooth out everywhere else and you're gonna lose some of the sharpness. That's where the threshold slider comes in. The radius tells us how much we want to remove it. The threshold then kind of says how much of the detail do you want me to bring back? So we'll now start to move up the threshold slider, very gently bring it up let go, let it compute it and check it out, bring up a little bit more. And the more we bring it up, the more we get to the point where we're adding a nice amount of sharpness. We're still getting rid of those dust, uh, those dust spots, but we're bringing back more detail. And I reckon around about 13, 14-ish, or even 15 is good. If I turn that off and on, off and on. The glasses are just nice and clear, but we've still got sharpness in the eyes, which is good. But what I will do, I'm gonna click OK to apply it. Obviously that now applies that to the entire image, but now I want to kind of just bring back for sure the detail in the eyes. And we're just gonna use a simple mask for that. So now that we've got the glasses done, I will just simply um, add a white layer mask to that particular layer there where we've worked on the glasses. So we can still see the results of that dust and scratches filter. I'll get a brush, making sure I have a black foreground color, 100% opacity, and I'm gonna put the flow there at uh, 100 as well, nice and simple, and I'll just come in and just brush it over the eyes to bring back the detail, even though you know it's not horrendously sharp detail, we'll sort that out in a minute, something like that on the eyes. So now if I turn that off and on, fantastic. Okay, very, very happy with that, cleans up the glasses really, really well. All right, so the next thing I want to do with this one here then is just to sharpen the eyes. Let's, let's add some sharpening to the eyes. I'll do that by adding a new blank layer. We'll call this one Sharpen Eyes. And for this, I'm gonna use a tool that is kind of often overlooked, but it is incredibly powerful within, uh, within Photoshop, and it's just the Sharpen tool. It is really, really good. Find it over here in the toolbar. We've got the Sharpen tool just here. In the options, when we first of all choose this, what you'll find is that the strength is set to 50%. That, in my opinion, is way too high. So I'm gonna knock that down to say 20. Uh, and because again, we're working on a blank layer, we want to make sure that where it says sample all layers, we have a tick in that checkbox. And also you've got a checkbox here that says protect detail. Now I would suggest whenever you see a box that says protect detail, advanced, or anything like that, put a tick in it. Get your money's worth, all right? But definitely when we're doing sharpening like this, we want it to protect detail. So we'll put a tick in that particular checkbox. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in and I'm gonna reduce the size of the brush just a little bit and then I'm gonna paint round and round the actual eyes. Now, just so that you know, with this, when you use the sharpen tool, 
I've set it to 20% strength. I'm gonna press down with my tablet here, my pen tablet, and go round the eyes. Now, when I first go, first of all go round, it applies 20% sharpening. If I don't lift off, I just carry on going round over and over and over again, it adds more. So 20, 40, 60, 80, it'll just keep on building it all up. So that's why I lower it down and then just take your time going round so then you can start to see the sharpening coming in and you'll know when to stop. All right, so I'll go here to so get the brush and I'll go around. So there's once, that's 20, 40, 60. I'll probably stop there, but I think that's about, is it 80, something like that? So that's before and after, before and after. I don't want to be scary, kind of carry eyes. We don't want to go crazy with this. Keep it so it's still realistic, but uh, something like that. That'll do for there, I reckon. All right, now there is one thing which I wasn't going to do with this. Uh, I know I'm, I remember doing this in the final retouch. I didn't know if I was gonna bring it into this particular video, but I will. Uh, frequency separation, all right? And the reason I'm gonna do frequency separation is because of this. If we just zoom up, you can see at the top of her head where we've got these different skin tone here. Can you see where the top of her forehead and her hairline it's kind of, there's a definite difference between the two. And I just wanna kind of soften that down a bit so it's not so obvious, all right? So the way I'm gonna do that is this, uh, is I'll click on the uppermost layer. I'm gonna create a merged or stamp layer to the top of the layer stack. And I do that on Mac, holding down the Shift, Option, Command, and E. On Windows, Shift, Alt, Control, and E. And that gives me a duplicate layer here. I'm gonna call this one uh, Color. And I'm also gonna duplicate that one, and I'm gonna call this one Blur. Uh, no, call this one Detail, actually. We'll call this one Detail. Now, the, these are the steps that I use for going through frequency separation. Don't worry about remembering all this. I have got a longer video going through this all in detail, and I'll put a link to that in the description part of this video. But uh, what I need to do then for this frequency separation to work so I can blend this top of the skin here is to, um, first of all, separate the color and the detail of the image. I'll turn off the detail layer and go to the color layer. And all I'm gonna to do to get the color from the image and no kind of detail is just blur it. So I'll go to filter, blur, and Gaussian blur. Now the amount of Gaussian blur you wanna use generally for most kind of cameras, I would say, certainly if I was doing this, if the picture had been taken with my a7R4, which is 61 megapixels, I'd probably blur it around about four or five, something like that. This is the Hasselblad uh, um, file, 100 megapixels. So it needs to be a little bit more. So you could maybe look at blurring it to seven, eight, maybe even up to 10, something like that. I'll go for seven. It just kind of looks enough for this particular image here. So I'll go for seven and we'll click OK. So that's the color. Then I'll go to the detail and we'll go to uh, image and apply image. And all I'm doing here is this. I'm gonna to go to the, uh, list. at the top here, we've got the source, that's the image that we're working on. The layer that I want to be in this part here is the color layer. So I change where it says layer, change it to the one that I enabled color. I'm also then gonna click on invert. And you can see here, we've got the blending mode of add, definitely making sure that you've got the blending mode of add, and these numbers will automatically, be, automatically appear. Two for the scale, zero for the offset. So don't worry about that. I've no idea what they do. Some very, very clever people have worked that out. I am not one of them. But when you do these settings, it'll automatically put those numbers in. So we've got the color layer, inverted, blend mode is set to add, uh, and that's it, we'll click OK. So obviously now we can see all the detail. We need to see the color as well. So we'll just change the blend mode of this layer to linear light. It looks like we go back to normal. So on one layer, we have the detail. The layer below, we have the color, all right? So now what I want to do is just make, uh, muck about with the color without affecting the detail. The detail layer, as you can see, is on the top of everything. So that's always going to be there. So I can play around with the color. The detail will always be on top and not be affected. So what I'll do just simply is I'll add a new layer, I'll get a simple brush, and I'll make sure that the actual brush itself has got 0% hardness, nice and soft. In the options bar at the top of the screen with this particular brush, opacity at 100, but I'm gonna take the flow down. I'll take that down to maybe something like, oh, uh, we'll put that at 100. I'm gonna take the actual um, flow down to maybe something like 20, let's go for 20. So that's gonna build up. 
And all I will do, and I'm doing this quick, bear in, bear in mind, I am rushing now, but this is the kind of thing I would do to fix this difference in skin tones. Uh, now that I've got the nice soft brush, let's make it a bit bigger. I'll hold down the option key, and you can see when I do that, we get the color sampler. So I'll sample just a small part of the darker part of the skin, just say there, and then just brush gently. Can you see that? I'm blending it all in. I won't use the same color all the way across. I'll make several samples as I move across. So this lighter area here, let's just sample a bit of the darker skin just below it, and then just brush gently. That flow will slowly build it up so it covers it over. Let's try this bit here, build it up, something like that. And I'll just do one last bit, say over here, and we'll just brush that in just there. So I'm going quick. In fact, let's just do that one bit there. So going quick, what you can see, before and after, before and after. Nice and simple, but it really does fix that difference in skin tones. A very, very simple thing to do. And those two layers there, the color layer and the detail layer, there is absolutely no reason why not you couldn't create a very quick action for that. So you can just press it and just get on. I did used to have one. I do need to put one in. In fact, if you're in my newsletter group, I'll send one out this week. I'll do it so you got it that's this week coming in. All right, so last couple of things I'm gonna do then with this uh, portrait. Like I said, I didn't want to go overboard with it. Uh, I'm gonna use my 2010 technique, which I absolutely love for having a little bit of contrast in there. So again, I'm gonna create a merge or stamp layer at the top of the layer stack. This one I'm gonna call because obviously with the 2010 technique, a lot of people have said, look, you've done that on the men, or the male portraits, but would you do the same with a female? Absolutely not. We'll bring those settings down because we don't want to have to, uh, picture to have as much punch on a female side of things. So rather than using 20 for the first one, I'm gonna go for something like 12. So I'll call that layer 12. I'll then go to the filter menu, sharpen, unsharp mask. And you can click on the picture just there. And in the settings here, the amount and the radius, the amount I'll put to 12, whatever the amount is, the radius will be the same and the threshold always zero. So 12, 12 and zero. If I click down in the preview area, off and on, you won't probably see it on your screen, but there is a difference. It's added like a, almost like micro contrast onto the picture just there and we'll click okay. Now obviously what that's done is it's added the contrast that I've just applied, that unsharp mask to the whole image and I only want it on the face. At the moment with this layer, I only want it on the face. So I'm gonna add a layer mask, a black layer mask I'll get a brush with a white foreground color. We'll zoom in and I'll just brush it so that it appears on Dai's face. This is only, the only area that I want this particular contrast, this particular sharpening to be applied. So if I show you what I've got there, that's where the actual sharpening is now being applied on that white particular area there. Let's just put that flow all the way back up to 100 just so we get it nice and dense just in there. So that now has been applied just to that area of the picture. I'll do one more merge because there's two parts of this technique. Like in the 2010, we're now going to do 12, 6. This is what this is going to do. Uh, let's call this one 6. And again, we will go to the filter menu, sharpen, unsharp mask. And when this comes up, in the amount, I'm going to say 6. And in the radius, I'm going to say 6. Threshold again stays at 0. All right. Click on OK. Now with this one, I don't want it to be applied to the entire picture, so I need to use a layer mask. And I also don't want it to be, to be applied to the whole face. I only want it on the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And this is a technique, if you haven't seen it, that I've got on my um, YouTube channel. I think I did it on a picture of Brian, actually, who's in the chat there. I can see Brian busy tapping away there. Uh, did it on his picture, and it really does make the portraits come to life. It is a huge difference when you see this for real on your own screen. This Just this double kind of contrast technique with two layers, it makes the face look as if it's coming out of the screen. Or if you've printed it, it looks like it's coming out of the print. It gives it way more life. Massive, massive difference. Uh, so that's, that, that's all done there. I need to add the layer mask. I'll just get the brush, and I'm just gonna brush this over the eyes, down the nose, and on the mouth, something like that. So you can see now, if I click on it, that's where that's been applied. All right. The last thing I'll do before we go back over and just one step to finish off in Lightroom is I'm gonna add just a little bit of a glow. And I do this to a lot of my images. This is something I've been doing now, maybe for the last year and a half, whether it be a landscape, a seascape, or even a portrait, to some degree, I do this. And I just find that it really does add uh, certainly in a picture like this here of Di Edwards, it, adds, it just adds a little bit more dreaminess to it. 
Very, very simple. I'm sure you will have seen this before. Uh, uh, some people call it the Orton effect. The actual steps I'm going to show now isn't the Orton effect, but it's a similar kind of way of doing it. Uh, okay, I've created a merged layer, the top of the layer stack. I'll rename it to Glow. And all I'm going to do is go to the filter menu, choose Blur and Gaussian Blur. Now, the amount of blur you apply in here is all dependent on the size of the sensor, the image sensor that you have in your camera. So if I was working on a picture of my A7R 4 61 megapixels, I'd put 60, 61, something like that in for the amount or for the radius in here. Again, using the Hasselblad, 100 megapixels. So in here, I will type in 100 for the radius and then click OK. Oh, not a thousand. We don't want a <laughs> we do not want a thousand. Let's see if we can cancel that and come out. Blimey, that would be uh, that'd be interesting. So go filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and we'll put 100. There we go, that's better. And click OK. And then let that apply it. You can see how this is slowing down now. Now I'm going to show you why that is in a minute. But I'll then change the blend mode of this layer here to soft light, and I'll just lower the opacity to something like 30. So look, before, after, before, after, just a little bit of a glow. Now, one little side note, just below where my circle is now that I'm appearing in, in Photoshop we have where we can check out the dimensions of our particular picture. Now, what you'll see this, you, you probably won't see it where you are now, but this says, uh, the document says 577 megabytes, and then a forward slash, and then it says 3.99 gigabytes. Basically what that means is, at the moment, the image with these layers in here, bearing in mind it's the Hasselblad, is 3.99 gigabytes. That's a huge, huge file. But Photoshop is saying if you now flatten it, so you have one layer, that file will be 577 megabytes, which is pretty much the size of the file, the raw file, that comes out of the Hasselblad. That's a huge file, all right? So what I am going to do, because I've obviously finished this picture already, what I am going to do is flatten this just to help out with doing this live stream so we don't have to wait for a, almost a four gig file to save back over into Lightroom. So I'll go to the flyout menu in the top right hand corner of the uh, layers panel and I'll just choose flatten image. Give it a moment to flatten it down and there we go. So now in the bottom left hand corner it says both numbers, 577 megabytes. Thank Lord for that. All right, so that's done there. I'll just then go Command or Control S to save it. And then we'll go uh, close that picture out and we'll dive back into my Lightroom where we've now got the picture. So this is the one. Let's just go to the grid view. Yep, this is the picture that we're now finishing working on. And the last thing I'll do is I'm a huge fan of presets. I absolutely love presets. And the one I used for Di Edwards's picture was um, ones that are built in. They're already already built into uh, into Lightroom or Camera Raw. And there's one called Cinematic 2. That's the group of presets called Cinematic 2. And the one I used was this one, CN16. I absolutely love that blueness, that the coolness that it adds to the picture. In fact, it almost gave that kind of teal and orange look to it with the warmth of her skin contrasted against the coolness of the surrounding. And what I liked is because the chair was blue to give it a little bit of a blue tint elsewhere. Now, I'm not gonna keep it at that amount. I can obviously, with it being a preset, I can uh, reduce the strength of that, bring it down so that that's kind of like a subtle amount. All right, so something like maybe around about 25-ish something like that. And I think actually one last thing I will do, let's have a look here. I'm going to go to a mask and I'll do this on a lot of portraits. Go to a brush uh, and what I'll do, let's just increase the brush and I'm going to brush over her face. Let's show the overlay. Brush over her face, something like that. Okay, turn the overlay off and I'm just going to add a tiny amount of exposure, just a little bit, just to add a little bit of a kick of light on her face. So we can go before, after, before and after. Yeah, like that. All right, so that is the, uh, that's, that's the retouching steps on that one there. Let me now just go to the uh, original final. Let's have a look in here where we are. There you go, there's the original one that I actually uh, retouched. What I'm gonna do now, just very quickly, let's just bring this over here. I'm gonna go back to this, come back to uh, full screen. There we go, and I'm gonna switch over to the, uh, what is being affectionately called the Barry White microphone. Uh, right, 
So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to quickly play you a very short video, which if you haven't seen my socials lately, uh, I posted a video when I went back to see Di Edwards, and I actually delivered her portrait for her. All right. And if you haven't seen it, I want to just play that for you now, and then we will dive into questions with my special guest. Let me just play this video for you. You've been up to it again, haven't you? <laughs> I like the envelope anyway. Oh, that is lovely, Chris. <laughs> I look as if I'm saying to you, what do you think you're going to do next? <laughs> oh, you like it, yeah? Lovely. That's a that's that's beautiful lovely. picture, isn't it? Oh, it's super. Do you want to show it? Oh, boy. There we go. Yeah, look. I love it. It's that just just such a lovely. Everybody that's seen it has gone like, "What a beautiful expression!" It just makes you think. Really what, what are you thinking? A piece. It gives me the sense of being cut at peace. My own, cut my own hair. Wash <laughs> my own hair. My own teeth partly. Not doing bad. Can't hear. Can't see properly. You're doing all right. Like I can't 93? taste any food. Can't <laughs> smell anything. But otherwise, I'm still. Here. <laughs> you beat COVID. Yes, I think I'm coping well. You are. I don't want you, I don't need you yet. No, I no, might do one day, but still, it's not, not at the moment. No. Well, there's another, there's another picture there as well. You are look at this one. That Probably is absolutely And there's that one. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I haven't got many wrinkles, have I? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the quote of the day, that is. Brilliant. I've had a look, and you don't see me, and see no wrinkles on people of 70. <laughs> that, is, that is lovely. Oh, I like that. DVD on the stage, man. Next one out of 10. <laughs> oh, you you are a stunner, aren't you? Beautiful, isn't it? How much are we? How much are we? Yes. <laughs> Uh, have, you show, have you shown them to other people? He wants a year supply of uh, wants a year supply of Welsh kicks. <laughs> no, we haven't shown to anybody else yet, though, because they've just been delivered to you. Oh, that's lovely. I can't get over. I think that's super too. And I'm saying here, where do I go from here? Yeah. So yeah, what I. I've seen some of the comments that have been coming through as I was, <laughs> as I was playing that there. And um, yeah, Tom, she's so lovely. You're absolutely right. She really is. What an absolute sweetheart. Brian here saying this is such a special moment. Beautiful. Mate, you know me. You you know me. Things like this it just makes everything, everything that you do, the miles you put in and all that kind of stuff, it just makes it so worthwhile. And Mike, my friend Mike Stapleton's put, just how you'd like your nan to be. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't agree more with you. Absolute sweetheart. But listen, now it's time to have some questions because I understand there are quite a few questions that have come in and I do have somebody waiting in the wings who's going to help me out with these because I've seen there's quite a few things coming in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute him and I'm going to bring him in. This is my friend, Anthony Crothers. Anthony, can you, uh, can you hear me all right? Definitely can, mate. Yeah, oh, I can yeah, hear okay, you. So fantastic. Fine. All right, brilliant stuff. So, um, right, questions then, mate. Have we got uh, any questions that you can kind of uh, let me know about? We've got quite a few, mate. How much time have we got? Uh, we've got quite a few questions. And, and well, we'll, do maybe, well. Uh, we'll do maybe 10, and then I can kind of answer some of them afterwards as well. Oh, well, it's all good, mate, all good. Um, well, David was asking a question uh, about uh, whether you tried Giga AI uh, for resizing. Uh, that was a question fairly early on. Uh, ever can, used uh, 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 David Palermo? It was asking, Gigapixel uh, AI. Okay, so uh, so yeah, Gigapixel AI. I've definitely used it. Fabulous Topaz stuff. There's some other software that I've compared it against. I think I did a video on it as well. Um, but my favourite, without without a doubt, Topaz Gigapixel. So yeah, David, really really good bit of kit. So if you're using it, good choice. Uh, and then we had one from uh, Patrick William. Uh, it was more of a question slash comment, I think, this one. Yeah. Uh, about the uh, the autofocus being the Achilles heel. On, I presume Patrick is talking about the Hasselblad. Right. Um, and okay. uh, he's saying 
the auto focus is the Achilles heel for him. Right. There we go. Oh, so he must obviously have the uh, have the hassle blood then. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't find. I didn't tend to have an issue too much with the uh, with the autofocus. It was. It seemed to be okay. Um, but then I didn't really use it in anger. I mean, obviously, you guys. Uh, we we did a photo shoot in the studio, uh, the barbarian kind of thing, the Viking thing. We did that. Uh, I did this shoot with uh, with Di Edwards, and I went out and did a couple of landscape stuff. Went down to Cornwall with my friend Steve Healy. So I didn't really use it in anger. So how I did use it, it seemed to perform perform really really well. Because a lot of the times as well, because that that big LCD screen on the back, you can tap focus. And I was using that, and that just seemed to work really really good. So um, so yeah. That's all I can say about that, I guess, really. Okay. Thank you, buddy. Um, now hopefully, I'll get this gentleman's uh, name correct. It, apologies if I don't pronounce it correctly. Umut is asking, can you show us how to remove chromatic aberration on hair? Uh, obviously, that um, question came in during the recharge claim. Chromatic aberration in hair. I'll tell you what, I won't, I won't do it in this because I'm not kind of prepared for it, but I'm going to make a note of that. With my trusty pen, and I and I'll do a I'll look to do a video on it, a pre-record video on that one to add onto the YouTube channel. So um, I'll kind of let everybody know on socials and on newsletter. Put it out that way. Okay, uh, and then going back to the Hasselblad, Roland Roland uh, Rick Photography was asking about uh, why not use the focus for getting all the advantages such as the Hasselblad Natural Color Science. So that was from Roland Rick Photography. Um, I'll be right. Okay, Roland. I'm guessing that you're probably uh, a Hasselblad user, but I know that you've got the Hasselblad software because the guys at Hasselblad were encouraging me to use it. I did download it. Two reasons why. The first one was I didn't want just I was getting a loaned camera, you know, just for a number of weeks. I didn't want to have to go and learn a new piece of software to get the images in there and to work on them. Secondly, and people will probably dispute this, but I didn't notice much of a difference when I did have the actual focus software up and running. I didn't really notice much of a difference between Lightroom and the, the color science within the, Hassel, the, the Hasselblad software. So maybe because I didn't dive into it as much as, as I could have done. But for what I was doing, the time I had it, I didn't really see the need for it. But it's, it's a good question. Um, it was certainly something that guys at Hasselblad were pushing me about anyway. So. Let's just do a maybe do a couple more, Anthony, and then I can always yeah. answer those the, the, on the uh, uh, type well, them out two, chat as well. Two more, mate, if that's okay. We got one yeah, from yeah. John. John John Inglis uh, is asking yeah. you to if if you uh, are likely to make a preset pack available. So uh, that was a. I think John it must be keen because he asked oh, twice. Is it this one? Is it this one here? You're going to make a preset pack, my man. Reason I'm asking is because I love the D. All oh, right, cool. That's the, um, that's, that's John, the I hadn't even thought about that, but that's definitely worth thinking about. Obviously, we did the uh, the desaturated one, which seemed to go really well. So thanks for that. I've uh, obviously the last week and two weeks I've offered that um, the Lime Storm preset, um, and then there's obviously one I could work out for. Yeah, we'll see. I'm not going to rush it because that just seems to be something that a lot of people just throw out presets left, right, and center. Let's wait until I get ones that I'm using regular that I've built up and I'm really happy with, and you may be seeing quite a bit of me using them, and then I'll look at putting them out. But thanks so much for even asking about it, John. All right, last one okay. then. <laughs> last one, last one, Glenn. Well, Jonathan, Jonathan Lewis was asking. Uh, there was a chat going on between Brian, Jonathan, and myself about the which book would you think that you've um, you've written would be most suitable for the the process, the retouching you've shown this evening. Um, Brian and I uh, said that obviously they're on Amazon. Oh, right. Okay, books, but, yeah, I think but, yeah, I can see that uh, that Brian answered actually the and I totally agree with him. Photoshop Toolbox so, is a really good one, but then the yeah. latest one, layers, the, the uh, layers and selections one, would probably be a good one to go with. So yeah, but I hear they're written by somebody really good. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm very, I, I'm very modest. Uh, and and one final one, can you just give Thomas a wave? Um, Thomas oh, Thomas. Is, Hi, Thomas. He's, he's, he's watching. <laughs> oh, bless him. Right, listen, mate, thank you so thank much. You, really appreciate you diving in and helping out with that. So uh, I'm My sure pleasure. we'll see you again. Cheers, buddy. Thanks very much. All righty. 
All righty. So there you go. Just thought it'd be nice to bring Anthony in just to help me out with some of the questions there. I mean, that's been really active. Oh, get rid of that one. It's been really active in the in the chat, which is which is fantastic to see. But um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I think that's all I wanted to go for. I'm going to go now. <gasps> Longer than I expected. Um, thanks for sticking around, folks. Next week, I'm going to be going through something really different. It's a, a portrait from the Friday just gone. If you've seen the film Hancock, the intention is that I'm going to be doing a picture that's like the movie poster for Hancock. Maybe. But I'll keep you posted on socials and on the newsletter. But Guys, thanks so much for uh, for joining me. If you haven't already, please, I'd really appreciate it if you just click on that like button and subscribe. It doesn't cost you a penny, but it's a great way for me to see that people are enjoying the content so that I can just keep on doing this kind of stuff. I love doing the live stuff. Just seeing the interaction, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. So, um, yeah, there you go. That's me. I'm done, as the saying goes. I will catch you next week. Thanks very much for tuning in. See you, folks.